Hello and welcome to today's program. My name is Mary McClary from Plymouth Teaching Primary Care Trust and our aim is to bring you a lively discussion on the challenges and the issues that you might be faced in practice when you're looking at the nice guidance um, primary care trusts, students, health professionals and possibly patients as well and a very warm welcome to all of you but particularly if we have any patients listening that, that's really good news. Um, this, is, this is being relayed right across Devon and Cornwall and what we're aiming to do is spread the message. Today's presentation is actually the fourth in our series and we are going to focus on the inhaler devices for the treatment of chronic asthma for older children. We're absolutely delighted to have two experts with us here today. One is Deirdre Woolley and she's the children's respiratory nurse, Deirdre is here, children's That's respiratory me. nurse from Plymouth Hospitals Trust. And our other guest is Faye Doris who's Senior Lecturer at the Institute of Health and Social Work in Plymouth. We're going to start then by Faye giving you a breakdown of um, an academic perspective on the evidence that underpins the guideline. Thank you, Faye. Thanks. Hello and good afternoon. This afternoon I'm actually going to present the NICE National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidance on asthma inhalers for routine treatment of chronic asthma in older children aged 5 to 15 years. The Institute actually says that the guidance that is presented should, or oh, I'll start again. The guidance presented by the Institute actually provide a view for us that has been arrived at after careful consideration of the available evidence. Health professionals are expected to consider these when making a clinical judgment. What the Institute actually says is that the guidance that are provided do not override the individual responsibility of health professionals to make appropriate decisions in the circumstances of the individual patient in consultation with the patient and or their guardian or carer. I believe the statement is actually very important because fairly often in practice we may look at the guidance or guidelines that have been presented and believe because NICE has provided these for us that we have no responsibility to do to use individual clinical judgment and really at the beginning of all of these it's really reminding us as professionals where our responsibilities lie and how we use these. It's actually very important when we're looking at any of the Institute's guidance or guidelines to consider previous work that has been done in the area and I think when you hear in a little while what guidance has been provided for us in relation to asthma that it's important to do so with this one. The British Thoracic Society guideline issued in 1997 was the most commonly used in the UK. It's not especially evidence-based. It largely considered the management of asthma in adults and older children the principles of selection of devices were stated, but recommendations about specific devices were not made. Now the one I've referred to here and what has been referred to in the guidance was done in 1997. That has since been updated and we've had a more recent guidance from the British Thoracic Society in January of, 90, of 2003. And for us, because this NICE guidance was produced in April 2002, it's important to remember that we've got additional work produced by the Society in 2003 that should also be considered alongside this. So whatever we're doing, the importance to the practitioner is to always remember that we do not use what's provided as the Bible but remember to look elsewhere to see what is there and use the combinations of evidence available to us. 
it's important to actually look at how the decision was made and how the guidance was put together. And really the, appra the appraisal process for putting the evidence together came about after the examination of the evidence on the clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness of inhaler devices and wide shareholder consultations. The appraisal process involved systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. And those of you who've looked at the presentations we've done previously in this series would get some background to parts of the appraisal process. And I'm really only going to touch on a few of these here. And I'll actually start by reminding everyone what a systematic review is. It's a review of research-based evidence on a topic in which the evidence has been systematically identified, appraised and summarized according to predetermined criteria. The systematic reviews uh, involve the examination of randomized controlled trials. And again, it's timely to remind ourselves what those are. They are a trial in which subjects are randomly assigned to either a group receiving an intervention that is being tested or a control group receiving an alternative or no intervention. The, res the results compare the results of different groups. And in research terms, and certainly by medical research, randomized control trials are often quoted as the gold standard. And it's really important that when we're looking at levels of evidence and what's the best available evidence out there, in biomedical terms, these are often seen as the best. Now, in looking at the review and the evidence in relation to clinical effectiveness, the findings were that the specificity of the device and drug effect meant one drug in one device could not be compared to other drugs. The available evidence was limited in relation to quantity and quality. The studies claiming to demonstrate equivalence were unable to do so, and some studies used inappropriate dose comparators. The available evidence was therefore limited and poor. You will find as you work your way through this guidance that there's a recurring theme occurring in relation to the evidence. There's the evidence that has been found for, in most situations have methodological flaws. And certainly it's something we need to consider when we look at the guidance on, in its entirety. The evidence was also examined in relation to the delivery of bronchodilators. What was actually found is they examined 23 studies. Some used inappropriate dosing schedules, which may have biased their findings. Some included a high proportion of adults. So when we're looking at a study population and we're trying to make inferences from what was presented, bearing in mind this guidance is particularly looking at children aged 5 to 15 years of old, age 15 years of age, studies that, include in, that included adults are inappropriate and it's a methodological flaw. So we can't really make strong inferences from those. Some of the studies were small or included few children. So once again, a theme arriving where there are limitations in the evidence that was examined. In looking at the review and the evidence in relation to the delivery of anti-inflammatory drugs, a number of studies were examined. The quality of the studies was variable, either in relation to number of children or the use of the design. Well-designed studies did not report a difference in the effectiveness between devices. So again, if we're looking for strong guidance, that theme continues. 
The evidence also looked at CFC-free devices. And what was clearly found here is that there was no evidence of difference in CFC-containing or CFC-free devices. Although some reports were available of higher deposition of corticosteroids in HFA inhalers. The guidance looked at other influences and effectiveness. As healthcare practitioners, we look at providing care, providing treatment, managing clients, patients in an effective way using the best available evidence. So this guidance looked broadly at what else was available out there to assist in helping us or guiding us in relation to effectiveness. And this is what was found. They found 31 studies and the ease, ease of use, preference or compliance in relation to inhalers. The quality of the evidence was generally poor. Small numbers were used and once again some included adults. Only 11 were randomized controlled trials. Therefore only 11 met that sort of criteria of the gold standard. Continuing along this theme, some key findings were that good individual, bracket, verbal instruction was the key to good inhaler technique. Two studies found that above the age of five or six years of age, this was so regardless of the advice. And I think as practitioners, it's probably reassuring to many of you who are listening uh, that the human bit, the practitioner interaction with clients, was actually found in the evidence available to us to be key in providing effective care. And this is something that I think we all need to remember. In its totality, looking at cost effectiveness, something that's often required of us from health care managers that we must provide cost-effective care. They found no robust cost-effective e effectiveness or utility studies examining the use of inhalers in children aged 5 to 15 years. And I think that's actually quite important because there's a range of devices out there that can be used by practitioners. And when we're looking at cost, um, no evidence or no robust studies were out there to guide us as to what was the best to use. And I'm sure in a little while when we have a wider discussion, Deirdre, who is here as a clinical expert in this field, will be able to expand on this and share with us some of what's out there and give us a view and some of the devices available to us. Things that need to be considered and some of the conclusions that were drawn. The available evidence failed to distinguish adequately between devices to suggest advantage in clinical effectiveness for one single delivery system. There was limited evidence to support the use of press and breathe measured device inhalers with large volume spaces compared to press and breathe devices alone in the delivery of bronchodilators. For me, in looking at this guidance and comparing it to some of the guidance available out there, one of the things that was very clear is that when we ourselves are appraising the NICE guidance, one of the things that we look at is the levels of evidence available to us. And some of the guidance are very clear and, and they rate and grade the levels. A level one star or a level one A may be evidence where there are lots of randomized controlled trials, where the meta-analysis clearly gives us a guidance or a guide as to what is the best practice to implement. 
down to where there's limited evidence, the level is slightly lower, where what we use may be expert opinion and what experts feel out there. And then the recommendations are graded based on these levels of evidence. What was very clear to me in this guidance as I compared it with others that I have looked at is this was not so. And what's provided for us is basically a summary of the evidence and some guidance as to how we take that forward. I have actually not gone into the studies and the detail of that work because I feel the Adri who's here with us this afternoon in discussion will be able to provide some guidance for us as we look at that and as to what is best practice. So it's worth remembering that. I am aware that some of you listening to this, I'm certainly aware that there's a group of student midwives on one of the sites listening to this presentation. And I think a group where the subject may seem irrelevant to the discipline that's being studied, the question may be asked is why are we looking at something in relation to asthma in children where I'm, for example, studying midwifery. I think what it's worth remembering is that in practice we look at the range of evidence, we look at evidence-based practice, we look at clinical effectiveness and as we look outside of our fields what becomes very evident to us is that all the guidance may not look the same and that there's a range of things that we need to consider when we're looking at best practice, when we're looking at clinical evidence. And I think we can learn from any guidance that's presented and from any discipline. And certainly myself, my background is that of a midwife, but I found a lot of core, team, core themes within this guidance that broadens my knowledge, broadens my expertise, broadens my ability to judge what's available to me in midwifery as I do comparisons of clinical effectiveness. Now, as I conclude, um, the evidence there tells us that economic analysis suggests that there's no device that should be excluded on the grounds of cost effectiveness because robust studies were not out there to give us a guide on this. The guidance clearly tells us, and I think we can infer from what has already been said that there's a need for further research. So what it actually states is that in view of the lack of robust evidence, the need for further good quality research has been identified and good practice guidance is however provided to enable us to use the lim limited evidence available. At this point, what I'd like to do is say thank you um, for listening. What I've provided is a basic foundation framework that we hope to expand on as we discuss this with Deirdre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faye. That was very helpful and a really timely reminder for us as health professionals of the importance of looking for the evidence ourselves and maybe not just assuming that there actually is evidence and sometimes lack of evidence is, is worth knowing just as much as, as, as some more robust evidence and quite clearly there's still a discussion to be had around these guidelines. Now for those of you listening at home or, or wherever you are listening, I'm sure you'll be wanting to phone us and ask some key questions. So I have a phone number here for for you to ring and it's 01752 233 646. So we look forward to hearing from you shortly and if you'd like to email us you can email us to the studio at plymouth.co.uk. So we'll stand by. And while we're standing by perhaps I might just take the opportunity to ask Deirdre um, as, as sort of as the conclusion of, of Faye's presentation draws our attention to the need to make sure that we are implementing whatever evidence is available. What do you think you've, you've felt from hearing that resume of the NICE guidelines and how does that add to the management of children's um, asthma here in practice? I feel the NICE guidelines are offer, offering a common sense, very simple approach to device choice. 
um, again, I think, it, as Faye said, it doesn't take away from the practitioner some degree of decision, but I think they've got to be guided by the child and their family as to what suits their lifestyle, and the guidance definitely helps you along right. the way. Thank you, Deirdre. Deirdre, we've got a phone call actually from somebody in Exeter who is just coming through to me now. Hello. Hello, Exeter. Hello, Faye. Okay. It's Margaret Fisher here. Um, obviously, as one for whom asthma in children um, isn't possibly quite so relevant to practice, midwifery lecturer, um, I found your session very, very interesting and your whole concept of, of looking at evidence as a whole really valuable, and it will be for the students as well. I just wondered, um, obviously some interesting nice guidelines have come out, um, and certainly within midwifery a couple of very useful ones have come out, but do you feel that in the uh, period of time as NICE produces more and more guidelines, their credibility may perhaps be in any way affected if they're bringing out guidelines which aren't based in, in robust evidence? Um, you know, if they're, if they're selecting topics where there isn't a huge amount of evidence available and yet are producing guidelines, do you feel this might impact on credibility in the future? I hope not. I think what it actually does, or a guidance just such as this does, is reminds us or really begs of us to look elsewhere. Because one of the things I did in preparing for the session is not only look to the guidance, in some of the guidance that have been provided, there's actually a technical report that goes alongside it and provides us with pages, 300 plus pages of the evidence that was actually looked at. So we ourselves could go back and make some judgments ourselves and become a lot more informed than the actual guidance that we're using um, that comes out as almost a summary document to us. In relation to this one, and this is something perhaps Deirdre could expand in, in a little while, um, the British Thoracic Society has provided a wealth of information. And I think when we're looking at specific disciplines, we know what's out there. And what we do is go back and do that almost a scanning of the evidence. Because the British Thoracic Society guidance was produced in January this year. It actually follows more clearly the line that some of the guidance we have seen that are more robust follows, where there are levels of evidence, where the recommendations are graded, and the studies there are very clear. Um, I, within themselves, they, again, they don't give the absolute guidance on what should be done. And I think as pr practitioners, we, we tend to identify within ourselves that we're practitioners in our own right and we should be able to make clinical judgments. So for, my, for me, I don't think I would always want everything to be written in tablets of stone because I think then we may stop thinking for ourselves. The good thing about this guidance is it will be reviewed in 2005, so it's not going to be around forevermore. And what we're doing is continuing to look at what's available as we put it into practice. I think perhaps it may be important to get a view from Mary, because although she's anchoring this session or chairing it on our behalf, she works with NICE, and she has a lot more background that may be able to add some more to what you're saying, Margaret. And what I'm going to do is bat this one back to her to see if Mary would like to add some more to this. Thank you, Faye. Well, that, that's very interesting, and it's great to be put on the spot, as you can imagine. Um, um, that's not, it's not really a problem, actually. I think what I was hoping to say anyway was that I quite understand health professionals' disappointment and sometimes frustration when the, the NICE guidance actually doesn't give a definitive yes or, or hard and fast no. But, but from my perspective on the board of NICE, I think it's incredibly important that if there is a lack of evidence, NICE says there is a lack of evidence, mm. NICE does not say yes or no. And just to bear in mind that the NICE work programme is, is given to NICE by the Department of Health. So ministers at the Department of Health, or Whitehall, decide that this is a priority for the NHS and that the NHS health professionals need guidance on, in this case, asthma inhaler devices for older children. So it's not really for NICE to say 
well, we haven't got the evidence, we're not going to waste money or time doing it, or to say, we think something else will be more important. That's the job, and that's the job that, that has to be done. And I think that some of the messages that come through on some of these guidance are actually very important. So, for example, we had a guideline earlier this year, or last year, on um, management of wound debridement, very, very similar, in that there was no one definitive product that was seen to be overall more effective than the others. Nevertheless, the message comes across, which is, please use a debridement product when dealing with wound care. The message here comes across as, please use the most appropriate spacer and metered dose inhaler. I've learned so much from Deirdre. <laughs> um, and, and those are the messages, and I think what we need to take home with us is that do that right, and we'll save a lot of secondary care further down the line, plus do that right and we might save money on unnecessary steroids and most importantly of all, discomfort to our patients. I'm not sure if that's entirely answered, but it's probably... Is that, is that, is that okay, Exeter? Or? They've gone. Oh, I don't blame them. <laughs> I, have a, I have an email message here from Ray Jones, which I could, I could read. The question to Deirdre, I think. Why do you think the British Thoracic Society brought out its own guidance and did it take into account the NICE report? In what ways did the British Thoracic Society and the NICE guidance differ? I don't know which of you might I, like to I take I feel that. they differ um, quite, quite a lot actually. I think the British Thoracic Society guidelines, we, we would be guided by those on actual treatment choice. Um, it hasn't, it, I think it's given something like four pages of the whole report to doing um, inhaler devices right. and it is very bitty what they've actually said on that. The NICE guidance I think has seen as supporting that paper, whether it was the previous BTS guidelines or now the reviewed guidelines and I think that uh, from, from my perspective the NICE guidelines offer us a very important piece of work Yes, the evidence isn't there, but as, as Faye said, it's actually going to be taking us forward. In 2005, we're going to review these guidelines. That guidance at that time, hopefully, we've been invited in the meantime to actually do further audit, look at the work that's happening around the, this sort of region in the care of asthma in children, device choice, look at these devices again and again, and actually try to achieve best practice. And I don't think we can overemphasize how right. important that device choice is in the care of asthma. So I think that we have to see, read these um, papers together and not as two completely right. separate entities. Yeah, thank you, Deirdre. Ray's, Ray's sent us another email, so we might just... Question from Dr. Brown in Plymouth. What types of research did I say were needed next? That might be for you, Faye, perhaps if you've had a chance to... I think because it's a subject that I don't deal with on my day-to-day -day, um, working, I'd, I'd like to bat that I one did, back to the a I, I did look at that um, in the paper, and, and particularly they're looking at probably audit more than anything, mm -hmm. and that could be um, sort of uh, area-wide audit or within each individual PCT, particularly looking at what they are prescribing. Um, in, in the paper it was looking at, um, in this age group, there's about 60% of the prescriptions for their drugs are a metered dose inhaler only. I think there was, I'm just remembering, 17% were breath actuated and 23% of those were dry powder. What they also picked up was only 20% of those being given a metered dose inhaler were given a spacer. We know that best practice is a spacer and metered dose inhaler for inhaled corticosteroids, for instance. So should we you know, be looking at what a practice is actually prescribing? Mm. Those figures were from NICE and they were covering England and Wales. Right. So we could look at that within our own area. Right. Um, I think the cost would be the other thing. What are we actually spending on um, inhaler devices at the moment? How many admissions to hospital is your uh, practice caseload having, how much um, are they actually a attending for emergency or acute exacerbations mm -hmm. and yeah. put that cost against getting the device right, right in the first place. Right. And I think that could probably, you know, do the sums and yeah. see if that would help. Yeah. So that, that would be your experience in Plymouth, would it, that, that when children come in to secondary care, 
sometimes they're inappropriately prescribed? Yes, or definitely. They've had uh, inappropriate devices prescribed to them. They come into hospital, they've had more and more drugs thrown at them in, in, for want of a yeah. better um, sure. way of putting it. But the basics of inhaler device choice and actually stopping and teaching them how to right. use the device has been right. overlooked. And Faye picked up on that point um, when she was looking at saying verbal um, sort of mm. teaching and that was acceptable in five to six year olds. I feel you need to take that further. Verbal says to me you just stand there and tell them how to use it. I'm afraid I'm down on the floor with yes. them mm. yeah. demonstrating interacting. and yes. interacting and demonstrating those devices. Yeah. And, and I think that more of that um, a lot of GPs, a lot of doctors and nurses have their own um, pref preferred inhalers. Yeah, sure. I know which one I can use yeah. best, but that doesn't mean my patients can use no. that one the best. Okay. And I think that's important to consider. Thank you, Deirdre. That's great. We've actually got Professor Jones on the phone as well as email, so um, <sighs> maybe we could hear the phone, the phone call, please. I just thought I'd try to keep you busy. I'd love to see you sitting there on your own. Um, can I follow up that, that last bit of discussion? Um, I mean, clearly the, this, there, there is a problem, isn't there, with, with these RCTs in trying to separate out you know, the, the actual device, the, the dosage, the, the advice yes. given by the professional, the training, the compliance, and all, all those different things, and presumably that is why the NICE, the nice guidance has, has come to a sort of rather inconclu inconclusive, um, mm. well, no, no conclusion. Um, have in in actually defining which studies went into their um, review in the first place, did they um, set criteria as to um, the, the verbal advice, the, the training, the, um, any other written advice that the children or their parents should have had to enter to be considered within the review, or did they consider everything? I mean, and is the, the fact that they haven't come up with any great conclusion mainly because um, the major effect is to do with education, um, compliance rather than any device at all. I'm going to hang up the phone here so I can hear your answer. Okay, bye. Ray, my reading of the guidance and the information that I found available around it is that they looked at everything that they could find. What I, because at the moment I'm involved in looking at sort of draft consultations and other guidance, I know the quality of the information that's often put out to practitioners. And where we're at with this, I, I didn't actually get an opportunity to go back and look at that sort of depth of information. But reading the guidance, they seem to have looked at everything along with the experts' view during the consultation, stakeholders' view, and everything was looked at. And the limitations, uh, the results that we, we found. So maybe Ray's question is one that he's also sent me on email, which is, had there been any head-to-head, i.e. one inhaler versus another RCTs? The answer to that is probably no. There weren't, I don't think. There weren't any like-for-like, no. exactly no. like-for-like no. RCTs in this particular study. No. No. Probably because the scope of the guidance is quite broad, isn't it? I mean, it's, I, I don't know if if everyone is, is actually familiar with it, but this, this is the document itself, and it's inhaler devices for routine treatment of chronic asthma in older children. That's actually a very broad title, yeah. whereas if, if the title had been the advantages over one type of inhaler versus another for children within this age band, that might have, that might have been a bit more specific. But, but it's inhaler studies. devices mm. right across the board. Mm. The studies aren't there, and, and particularly in children, and that's, I think, where this, this nice guidance falls down, is the studies in adults, yeah. but they've not been there in children. And I think that we've been working very hard towards best practice, mm. and it is difficult. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, cost is what is what leads it, and the cost of a metered dose inhaler as opposed to the cost of a dry powder or breath actuated device is quite wide. And I think that unfortunately that's, that's where the uh, problems come up. So could you just remind us, Deirdre, because I'm struggling with the terminology. Mm. <laughs> The meter dose inhaler is? That's just a press and breathe. You've actually got to coordinate what you're doing as you press the device. 
into the mouth you've actually got to coordinate the breath in and breath holding and it is it's very difficult and there have been papers to say that they reckon about 50 percent of the population cannot use that device correctly yes it's the most uh, prescribed and that would be in the adult population that they've done that mm -hmm. um, very few can use it. I would probably put it slightly higher um, a dry powder device is something that actually delivers on you breathing it in it delivers a very fine powder um, of drug and that would be in sort of a, a little extra powder for some mm -hmm. bulking to give you taste so that you know you've taken it and a breath actuated one is again it's a device that is a pressurized canister inside but you simply have to do a good breathing in technique mm -hmm. and that delivers it your, your breath actually triggers the device to deliver the drug at the correct time Right, so we've got three different That'd methods, be three. a range of different prices and a range of effectiveness. And, and, a, and a broad range of um, devices and different companies producing those devices um, in each of those types of inhaler. So if you had three key messages to give us mm -hmm. about what works best in terms of effectiveness, cost effectiveness and, and presumably comfort, what would right. those messages be? I think to, to limit me to three is, well, is difficult, okay. <laughs> but I feel that um, the, the biggest message is is that um, we've got to get beyond our own sort of biases. That that would be the first thing that bias goes out the window when it comes to inhaler device choice. At the top of the list or the bottom of the list, whichever way you look at it, cost again should not be your, your main consideration. Um, when you've got those out of the way, you can then look at what's available. When I uh, see young children, and I've not got somebody there holding pound signs over my head when I'm doing this, I'm grateful for that. I will look at devices, put the devices down for a child, and they will um, usually go and pick a device up and say they like the look of it. That, you're already halfway there their friend has the same device or you know the way mm -hmm. it looks mm -hmm. it sounds pathetic yeah. but sounds it takes real. you a long mm -hmm. way forward so then you, you'd find a device that they like and it would be you know you've then got to make sure they can use it they may not be able to and you've got to be quite brutal if they can't and say I'm sorry that's not the one for you but you've got the choice of these here right. and and it can be a long drawn-out process but the benefits outweigh the the time that you put in then so coming from primary care, it does help, mm. but I'm thinking about how we stop the families bringing the children into secondary care. Mm -hmm. So what do we do in the general mm. practice surgery? Right. Practice nurse, mm -hmm. GP, haven't got the range of devices no. you've got. They, they've, got, they've got the range there. They've got, you know, I suppose it's getting the samples. I think, I suppose we can look at education. We can look at, you know, helping them have the samples there. Um, teaching on, on the use of those samples that, uh, that they've got. I think then, you know, it's a broad age range, 5 to 15. Mm -hmm. I would actually reduce mm -hmm. that down. I'd be looking at something like 5 to 8, and then you consider different things around 8 to 11, and then you would oh, consider yeah. other things again yeah. from 11 to 15. So a metered dose inhaler, again, um, I do have a pretty hard and fast rule in that I would, wouldn't give a metered dose inhaler without a large volume spacer device or any spacer device to a child under the age of 11 years. Um, and that mainly because they just can't manage the right um, techniques. Again, the other devices that are available, there's some sort of query about whether they can actually manage them. And usually about eight you might find they can. So that brings in a few more. But certainly options, best yeah. practice I would see has been a metered dose inhaler with a spacer until we've actually got better evidence to, right. to show there are other things out there. Thank you. And do you think there's therefore a rationale for us considering some form of local training opportunities for, for primary care practices, perhaps around Devon and Cornwall, yes, to, to raise the profile of these two or three key issues, which don't seem to me to be something that would you know, cost us a lot of money or mm. take a great deal of time or effort, mm. but might in fact reap huge rewards further down the line. Yes, I yeah? do feel so that. So we might, you know, we might try and do that if we get the resources. And Can I develop oh, that? Because as I listened to Deirdre, what, what came over there just now for me was her level of expertise, her, her knowledge of the range and that experience of working with children and giving appropriate advice. Looking wider and picking up what Mary has just said, Deirdre, 
what's your sort of assessment of practitioners out there working in this field and the way we support or provide care in this area? I feel if we're looking at, like you say, you, you can't look too broadly at it, you know, you can't just sort of put the same brush across every GP mm -hmm. practice or primary care practice within the area. Um, I think there is an, an awful lot of asthma advice out there. I think we, we were talking earlier and I said that I think we've still got the same messages coming forward now as 20 years ago when I first probably started working with asthma and looking at asthma. I feel that um, there are good practitioners out there but we do need a little bit more help. Asthma is a subject that not become boring. I get very um, animated about asthma and it's certainly my soapbox. Um, but I think that there has been so much information coming through about asthma and then when you get something like the NICE guidelines that haven't got the evidence base that we're begging, I feel that it does come back down and go on the bottom of the pile. So it's actually not telling me anything. When I read the NICE guidelines I thought, my goodness, this is what I've been saying for years, cost shouldn't matter if, it's, if they can use an inhaler, they like it and they'll use it, forget the cost and go for it. And I think that really that's what we've got to do. We've got to get the practices excited about asthma again. Thank you, dear. I'm aware that there's a couple more questions coming in. I'm afraid this is an exciting topic for many people. Oh. <laughs> Rachel Carter has a question for you. Are you aware of any ongoing research which may give us more robust evidence in the future to inform us for the next review? And I don't know whether either of you I'm might not. be aware of any ongoing research. I'm not aware of any no. ongoing research at no. all at the moment. Um, would be keen to uh, become involved. To if become involved. <laughs> Keep that in mind. So sorry, Rachel. Um, sorry, Rachel. Probably what we need is is to perhaps find out. And I understand that we can do that on the Nice website because they do have yes. um, areas under review, yeah. and then the research that's underpinning that new review is available on the website. So I, I anticipate the work hasn't started yet. Mm. We're talking 2006, but nearer <sighs> the time we will see. And the research comes in, you can see it on the website and check it for yourself. Ray has another question for us. Does the panel know much about what is recommended in terms of advice or training in the use of inhalers by the British Thoracic Society? And on what evidence is it based? And, and Ray knows that there have been studies on different ways of giving information, but he's not sure whether these have any impact on best practice. So I guess it's really about the impact of the health promotion advice you're giving, mm. and do you know if there are any recommended best ways of doing that, or any ways okay. of training? Again, I think the, the evidence that we see, um, and after years and years of, of giving, uh, asthma education to families that they are very choosy and the bits of information they take on board and I think that really what we've got to look at is repeating that you know taking opportunities to reinforce the information that we give um, I think if you're looking in, in say uh, primary care um, the recommendations are now and, and certainly with um, GP contracts that are coming through is that at least an annual review or a review every 15 months of people with asthma should be um, the way they're going forward. Right. So I think it's really reinforcing right, things. Yes. But a lot of health promotion, unfortunately, I feel does fall by, by the wayside. But on a one to one, um, not at a time when they're in an acute mm -hmm. exacerbation, no, uh, that sure. stresses are high. Is, is difficult and certainly um, part of my work after an acute um, attack or for a child going into, into hospital is to offer a visit at home afterwards when that child's been home for about a week or two to actually go and visit the family and, and give them any help or support they may, they may want right. and then broaden that to school nurses and yeah. to um, health practice visitors. Nurses. And, and practice, practice nurses. nurses who have a big role to play in They this do stuff. have a massive role. I would say. So basically it comes down to the old rules of health promotion, that it's a trusted and reliable health professional giving that advice to a patient that they know. That's more effective than I, I other, would guess other so. forms. Yeah, yeah I, I think you're probably right. I think um, within any sort of situation, I, I feel that some, for some uh, people, just little bits of information often works best. Right. Others it's, you yeah. know, give them all the information, let them go away and think, think about, about it. it. Unfortunately, you, you, you don't always get it right. Yeah. 
I'm sure you tried, Deirdre. <laughs> Faye's got a question. Can I it. develop that question raised by Ray? Um, I think working so closely with him, I think I've got a view where he's coming from. Looking at where we're at now, mm -hmm. 21st cent century, most youngsters have got their own televisions at home, um, their computers. I'm not as familiar with the subject, the, the, the discipline and the work that's going on. Mm. And it's back to Deirdre to ask, do you know if we've started to look at and consider using the medium children are using nowadays, yeah. using See, videos? Yeah. Um, yes, we have. I mean, videos, I think, probably not quite so much now, but certainly um, computer things. And the National Asthma Campaign does, in fact, have an excellent website. And um, I think it's asthma. Dot UK or something like dot org dot UK I think is the website mm -hmm. and they have some good child friendly stuff on there I actually did have a go on it a few weeks ago and the games that were on there I couldn't do them they were definitely for the kids <laughs> I was useless um, but that's a good website to probably um, start with and that, that would be for, for families going back to Ray's question mm -hmm. do we know if that work has been evaluated I'm not, I'm not aware that, that medium of giving information. I feel that um, it's something I, I was keen to try and again in my clinic situation I tried to get that website up within the clinic situation and trial with with some mm. children and certainly I, I wasn't able to do it and I think that would be something I would I would be keen to try within that situation but whether it's happening elsewhere it may well have done and we do have a computer generated spirometry I know it's not what we're talking about yeah. but the children certainly do relate to that very well yeah. and they just love because it's computers mm. yeah. so perhaps when we're looking at a further research and seeing we've got this sort of period before mm. the next review if some of us are, could consider a look at mm -hmm. the medium of giving information mm -hmm. and the mm. effectiveness of it mm that may be helpful. It may, it may well be helpful but it doesn't, it doesn't take away that the device choice has to be right in the first place. The yeah. information is secondary to that and then um, to maintain adherence or compliance. But it certainly does that. suggest um, the possibility of a research project it does. looking at the effective methods of communication and mm. that's probably the question that, that Ray was asking us really. Yeah. I, I would suggest. Um, we don't seem to have any more phone calls or any more email messages. Um, I think we've probably Can I ask another covered question? most of the ground. Yes. Um, in lots of what we've discussed, we mm. haven't sort of placed a lot of emphasis around the family carers. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would expand on um, that may help when we're caring for the child? How, how do you mean? Sorry. Um, very often with these guidance they provide a user guide alongside mm -hmm. it and information for users, guardians, right. carers, whatever. Mm -hmm. We focused on the inhaler devices that were available. Yep. Is there any sort of guidance you would provide to us as we work with parents and carers or, or users to increase effectiveness? I think, again, not so much from the NICE guidance it, itself, but again, I'm saying the National Asthma Campaign, I feel as though I'm getting paid by them, but I'm not. Um, but I use their information an awful lot. They provide extremely good booklets and up-to-date advice, easy-to-read advice for families and carers. And I actually do um, send most of my families in that direction and do actually give booklets from them because it gives good down-to-earth advice and support. Thank you. Environmental okay. friendly. I, I found this interesting because <laughs> there are things that I, I didn't consider, I didn't think about. It's not a, an area I work in. And I thought, goodness me, I wouldn't have considered CFC free or CFC containing devices. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's commonly looked at it's, by yes. families? Yes, it is. Um, these are something that have just come to the fore in the last couple of years in that it was a directive that um, any metered dose inhalers, so pressurised inhalers, had to be CFC free and the companies have had to work very hard to be able to deliver equal amounts of drug with a non-CFC propellant. Um, what has happened, and at first I was not convinced by, by the first couple of families that spoke to me, but subsequently children are actually um, complaining that they taste differently, 
people don't feel they've got the drug because they can't taste it the same. The delivery is softer and it tastes different. So there is some, it's actually anecdotal evidence because it's just families saying it to you rather than anything else. The devices look the same, the drug is the same, but they're saying they're not working quite so well, but it's probably more to do with how it tastes and how it's delivered. Okay. One last message from, from Ray Jones, just to remind us um, that there is work being done by a PhD student at the University of Plymouth on the effect of air quality on respiratory disease. Right. And thought that perhaps Deirdre um, may not be aware of that. No, and it's I something wasn't. that you might like to link into, Deirdre, and it might be something that uh, the results of which could inform families about the air quality in their own homes. Yeah. So perhaps after this programme, we'll pick up the details of that with you That'd and link good. you with the researcher, yeah. which is excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Well, I think that probably concludes our afternoon so far. And I'd like to say thank you very much to Faye Doris and Deirdre Woolley for a really interesting and informative session. And thank you very much to the viewers at home for sending us your questions, your queries, which has made it, as you might expect, so much easier for us here on the couch. And finally, to say that if you did enjoy this program, you will possibly know that there's a series of inter interactive television programs on health starting on the 22nd of October, the first of which is on hypertension. It's essentially aimed at families and those with hypertension, but we, would, we will have clinical experts on the couch with uh, Professor Jones giving us evidence about the background to current treatments for hypertension. And 22nd of October is the date. They are situated in sites right across Devon and Cornwall. If you would like more information, I'll give you the telephone number 01752 233812. Email address health seminars, all one word, at plymouth.ac.uk. And I thought perhaps just to, just to end this session with two other website addresses that you might find useful. One is the one that Deirdre spoke of, asthma, the asthma, um, National Asthma Society, www.asthma.org.uk. NICE website, www.nice.nhs.uk. Either of those and the satellite seminar could, uh, website could provide you with um, further information for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you to our guests today. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you, Faith.